Well, thanks for coming to uh, this Unreal PDX talk. We're talking about the introduction to multiplayer in Unreal Engine. We're going to be using 5, but a lot of this uh, will be translatable to many versions in Unreal 4. My name is Mike. I'm a solo, de solo developer. I've been doing that for three years now. Uh, first on Rockland, my uh, spell-slinging MMORPG, and then that kind of got put on the side burner in September where I'm focusing on creating a multiplayer framework for people to create MMOs quickly and launch them at scale. We're not talking about that stuff, though. We're talking about getting started with uh, multiplayer. We're going to be talking about the networking fundamentals in Unreal, the different gameplay classes that Unreal has that you may have not seen them but never really paid much attention to them, and why they're important for multiplayer. We're going to try to do a little quick hands-on demo showing you how to set up the network stuff and get testing in Unreal. What's the difference between listen and dedicated servers? How does C++ fit into it? Where to go from there? And there's going to be plenty of time for Q&A. And then after all of that, we're going to head over to 10 Barrel Brewing for some food and drinks. So multiplayer in Unreal is summed down to just what's called replication. It's uh, easier to just think that is, that's just how this engine syncs a lot of stuff to it. You can get really deep into the weeds on how to change the replication graph, but we're not going to be talking about that. We're just talking about how replication is the process of reproducing game state from your server to your clients. It starts with replicating an actor. An actor, if you're not familiar with Unreal, that's just an object in the world. You set it and say, hey, I want to replicate this actor. It has some initial values like the transform, the variables in it, what materials on those static meshes, and things like that. And those, like I said, there's variables on that. And then there's replication for the individual variables themselves. Uh, so when the server changes that variable, it gets synced to the individual clients, depending on how that's all configured. For this presentation, that's all you really need to know about replication. We'll talk about how you set it up how to use it, and then there's a whole slew of problems that come with replication, but that's the process of building a, a multiplayer game. In addition to syncing state, there's also event-based messages or remote procedural calls. That's a familiar term in a lot of different languages in uh, software applications, RPCs for short. And if you're familiar with blueprints or uh, in Unreal, you can, are familiar with using uh, events in the event graph. And all you have to do is say, hey, under replicate, so after you click on it, you can set it to uh, whether it's going to go from the server to all clients, which is a multicast, from the owning client, we'll talk about ownership a little bit later, to back to the server, or the server back to the owning client. So that's how the basics of the different fundamentals you need to know of the how stuff gets moved from a network perspective. You, Unreal does a great job at abstracting that away so you can start at the very high level. And then as you get more advanced, you want to try to improve your performance, you can dive in deeper. So let's talk about how the different classes work in Unreal. It first starts off with a level, which is your world. You can put stuff in it. And that level has a game mode associated with it. If you're, you're probably familiar with it because you probably want to change your player care, your default pawn class uh, with a single player. But when you click on the game mode, these are the default classes you can have set up into it. And I can show that to you when we go through the demo. We're only going to be focusing on the ones in the blue highlighted section here. But uh, the other stuff gets more into uh, play if you're going to have spectators at any point in time someone that's watching the game but not playing the game. Uh, game sessions can help with facilitating people connecting. But for the basics, we're going to talk about these classes. But let's start off with the game mode itself. This is only runs on the server. So that means that its state, while the, the, the asset itself is packaged with the game sometimes, uh, its state isn't replicated to the clients. Only the server runs that logic, and, um, and that's that. 
So this was really good for match flow when you're like waiting for players to join the server. Let's start the match in five seconds. Let's, we're running the match. Match is over. Let's kick people back to the lobby. Or you want to have some extra logic when a player logs in. You want to go and do some extra post-processing. This is a great place for that. And then other server settings that you know, players that don't need to know what those are all about. So then we have, we have the game mode. Then we have game state. Game state's different from game mode in the sense that it's on all machines, all the clients and the server. So this is a great place for server when something changes in the game. You're going to say, hey, clients, you now need to know that there's two seconds left in the, uh, in the match. So like the game mode might trigger that match to start, but then it changes the variable in the game state, and that gets sent to all the clients and synced up. Other things like the server name, which is great for when you have a list of servers and you want to see all the names or the number of players and the max players, all that's great for the game state. And a couple of other examples here that you could put in the game state. Now there's the player controller. This is when you start with a third person template in Unreal or first person at that either as well, usually you're given a character. You're not really exposed too much to the player controller. The player controller is one layer back from that. It's the first thing a client owns when they log in. They log into the server and it's given them a player controller. It's only replicated between the server and that client. So if I log into the server, uh, Nick won't see my player controller. He will not get my synced state. And vice versa, when Nick does it, I won't see his state. As it changes, the server knows both of ours, and it syncs to us individually, but I don't see those states. So that's great for stuff that I don't need to know about Nick's personal settings for the game. There's no real visual representation in the game for a player controller. You don't see an object in the world for it, no 3D representation. It's just this abstract actor uh, thing, but it's still an actor that lives in the world and it possesses pawns, which we'll talk about in a second. But there is a thing called player state. Each player controller has a player state. Similar to game state, this is a great place for stuff for individual players' information, like my name. I need to know Nick's name. Well, I don't need to, but it'd be great to. His health, XP level, whether or not PVP is enabled so I can try to attack him or not. Those are great stuff to put into a player state because I need to know it, and it's not great for the player controller because otherwise I wouldn't have that information. It's also good for a couple of other player state things here. Then we have the default pawn class. This, you may be familiar with the character class, because that's how we're all introduced to pawns. But character is just an inherited a child class of pawn. This is replicate, as well as player state, is also replicated to everyone. These are the physical objects. It's the bipedal character that's walking around in the world. That's a pawn. And player controllers will possess the pawn. You can think of it as the controller is the input that drives the thing that's running around, which is the pawn. And you can possess different pawns. You could be walking around as a person and then eventually hop in a car. That's a different pawn. So input could be handled in the player controller. If it's a simpler game, you'll have one pawn. Or if you want to separate your logic, you can put the input logic into pawns themselves, because the replication will still happen when you possess the pawn. So driving a vehicle, you may have honking braking and reversing, but you don't have jumping that you would have with like a bipedal character. And then we have the HUD class. This is great for widgets, uh, for things to show up on the screens, your heads-up display. Uh, you may not have used it in single-player games because you can spawn them wherever you want, and you can put them on the viewport, and that's great and all. But the HUD is all, doesn't replicate to anyone. It's only on the client which means it's great for managing your state, that you have the inventory open, or you have a shop open, or these other things that only are ne necessary to me, but not to other people. But I wouldn't put data in there, like the inventory itself, what items you have. That should go on your player state, because, or, or the player controller. 
probably the player controller, because you, Nick doesn't need to know that I have 5,000 gold, but he might want to know what I'm, what I'm equipped, because he needs to know I should, I'm holding a sword. Uh, but just to say that the HUD, not great for data, for your actual game state, but other things like the state of the UI is good for the HUD. So that was a big information dump. That's okay. Take a quick breath. I've kind of summed up what the replication graph looks like here. So we can see that we have the game mode, which is the, that main class that says all these other classes are part of this game mode and we're gonna instantiate them all. That's only on the server. It's not replicated to clients. We have player controllers, player controller one and two. They're synced between the server and their individual clients, but they're not synced between the two different clients. We've got player states, pawns, and game state. Those are all replicated to everyone. Everyone has all of that information. They need to know what the match state is or what each individual player's health is. Now, you may not need to know who someone's health is when they're on the other side of the map, and that's okay. There are variables to configure relevancy, but we won't be going into relevancy today. And then HUD and UMG widgets, no one needs to know about that except for yourself, and those are not replicated to each other. Now, you may notice I have not talked about the game instance, and that's because the game instance isn't replicated to anyone. It's only on your machine, but it does live off the entire life cycle of the application. When you click the EXE or launch on Steam that first time the Unreal loads, the game instance is started and it will end when the game is exited. But it's not relevant to the actual individual matches, the different worlds that you joined and things like that. It's the same class for your entire uh, application. Both the server and the clients will have the same game instance, but they will, the server's running a different world over here, and you're in the lobby, and then you're joining the world, and you're leaving, and you're going to another world, and the server's still on this world, and it's not a great place for a lot of logic. Good place for like uh, doing analytics for your players. You wanna see how long they're in their sessions, things like that. When they crash, what was the stuff? Game instance is great for that, but if you're using it for logic, think about Maybe there's a different place to put that. All right, so let's go ahead and do a demo here just to kind of really sum up how easy it is, and then we'll talk about the difficulties after that. All right, so I've got a little game here. Everyone can see all right? where we have this cube that can run around and it'll drop these little, I'm calling them bombs, but they don't explode. Pellets, whatever you might wanna call them. And this is great, it's working as a single player, but I wanna add another player and I want them to show that the different bombs are showing up on both screens and things like that. Well, the first things first is in Unreal 5, you can click the, two, the three dots next to the play button here Go to net mode, and the default is play standalone. I'm not sure what it is on Unreal 4, but these two settings are the same thing in Unreal 4. Play as client, and play as listen server. If you want to play as a listen server, the first instance, the first player, will be a server and a client. If you play as a client, then all of them will be clients, and the server will be running in the background. I personally like to do play as client for uh, the initial investigation of adding new features because it forces me to s make sure things are replicated. If you do play a server and you only have one client, then that's the server. There's no replication. They already have all the information. But if you say play as client and you only have one session running, then it has to be replicated. And then later I go back and I test as play as listen server to make sure the server logic and the client logic are both working. So we go ahead and play, press play as client here, change our number of players to two, and we're gonna say new editor window pi. You could do the selected viewport, but then that's just gonna have one in the viewport and one in another window, which is great if you have multiple monitors, but we don't have that right now. 
All right, so you can see here we've got two windows popped up. We've got client one on the right here and client two on the left. Neither of these are the servers, but they're both the clients. And I already replicated the movement. So you can see as I move around as client one, it's, being, it's telling the server I want to move in this direction. The server's like, OK, great. Let me change the state on my end for the entire world. And I'm going to tell other clients that that cube is also over here looking in this direction. And that happens basically every frame. But if we try to tr drop our bomb, you can see the bomb dropped on the on client one, the person that insta instantiated the bomb. But if we go and look at client two, that object is nowhere to be seen. So something's not being replicated properly. We're seeing it work on the client's machine, but the other client's not seeing it. So I don't know if the server has it and it's not replicating it to the other client, or the server may not have it at all. So let's take a look. So let's go ahead and open a couple of these classes here. So here's the game mode. So here is that first screenshot I showed you where um, we're in the game mode, and these are the, you know, the defaults for game mode. And you can see these classes. We have game state, player controller, player state, HUD, and default pawn. And I've changed these to B player controller, player state, HUD, and B pawn. We're going to go ahead and open those up. Uh, player controller. On player state. I did not change game state. We don't need that for this right now. OK, so let's start off with we're instantiating the bomb. The player controller is where I like to start with my input, and then I move it when I want to refactor things. So let's look at player controller here. So we can see here on a event begin play, I'm setting up some input stuff. And we've got movement. But movement's working, so we can ignore the movement node. I've got this event here for shooting, and it spawns a bomb. OK, great. So that's working here. But, and if we go look, it is spawning the actor. So that all makes sense, but it's not replicating. And the first thing to see is here, when you look at this event, it just says custom event here. And it would show more if it was being replicated. So if we open up the t details panel here, and we go and look at replicates, we see it's not replicated. So let's go ahead. We were, this is the client. The client has pushed a thing, an event has happened, and we're calling this function. But we want to tell the server to do the spawning of the actor. Because if we spawn the actor on the client, it won't replicate. It won't sync up. The server's got to set that up. So we're going to say run on server here. So now you can see it says executes on server. And even up on the call function, it says replicated to server if owning client. Now, owning client, I don't know if we really talked about the ownership stuff, just means that I am the player I logged in as a person. I was assigned this player controller. I'm the owner of this player controller, which means that I can actually talk back to the server. This is great for the player controller. It's easy to think about. But when I possess a pawn, when I'm possessed, I'm possessing the pawn, I am the owner. So if I jump into a vehicle, I'm now the owner of that vehicle, I can do RPC messages back to the server, the, these remote procedural calls of spawning something. But when I leave that car, I unpossess it, I'm no longer the owner. That's something to think about. You don't have to really get in too far into that when you're starting off, but just something to note. So cool, now we have executes on the server. Let's go ahead and give this a shot. So I'm clicking the button, and nothing is happening. So not really sure what's going on. Neither client is seeing the, the bomb drop. But we did tell the server to, to spawn the bomb. 
So one thing we can do is we can put a breakpoint here. And it did hit. So this logic is being called somewhere. And we can see that we're currently in the server. I mean, there's this big server simulating. Sometimes it's not trustworthy because the debugger is haphazard for blueprints. But uh, the server is calling this. It is stepping through. Looks like it spawned something. So if we go back to the level editor here, something I learned not too long ago, I wish I knew a long time ago, is in the outliner, you can click the cog wheel here, here and say, choose world. When you're not choosing the world, it's what's in the viewport. So I guess in this case, probably client one. But you can say, I want to see what the world looks like from the server's perspective. And so when we do that, we now see all of these bombs are here. And if we go back to client zero, they're not there. So the bombs are being spawned on the server. The server has them, but they're not getting to the client. So let's figure out what's going on with that. OK, so you know this code looks fine. Let's go ahead and save it. So we've got this bomb class. Let's go ahead and open that guy up. Well, the first thing to check is, is the actor set to replicate? Is it set to sync to the clients after it has been spawned on the server? So if you click on class defaults here, under the replication section, there's a checkbox for replicates. It's not checked. All right, it's checked. That should be easy. Oh, well, we triggered the breakpoint. Let's go ahead and remove that. All right, we see a bomb on client one. That's good. Do we see it on the other one? Yes, we do. So great. Just like that, all you had to do was go to a drop-down menu on the, on the event to say, I want to run this on the server, as long as you were in the only client in the player controller. And then we just had to make sure that the actor itself was set to replicate. There are, chan there are times where you want the actor to spawn on the server and not replicate to the clients. It's not very often more specific scenarios there. Uh, but then there's always the other way around, where you want it to spawn on the client, but you just only want it locally on the client there. So that was it. We now have some multiplayer logic. That's great and all. But I have this other feature that I implemented. Let's see if it works. Let me show it in single player. Also, if you didn't know, if you check on the bubble next to this, it won't close the menu. But if you click on this, it closes the menu. All right. so. I believe this will work in single player. So I changed our mode back to net mode. Each player has up to 10 bombs to spawn. And then uh, they won't be able to drop any more bombs. As you can see I'm not dropping any more bombs now. And my material on my actor went to red. I would like that to also be multiplayer so I can know that I'm out of bombs, Nick's out of bombs, et cetera. So if we go back and change our play as client here, we could keep it to one client for now, because we saw it wasn't working. But just to demonstrate that it's not working, we did not change to red. But we did stop dropping bombs. So that's interesting. All right, so if we went back to the player controller, we can see when we spawn the bomb on the server, if we look at the player state. That's just a variable that exists on the player controller. You can just type player state, scroll to the bottom, and you just see that is a variable that's attached to the player controller. It's also on the game state itself. So if you do get game state, 
You might have to cast it to your game state, but still you could say get player states, player array. And that gives you an array of all the player states that you know about. So game state gets replicated. So both on the server and the client, you can get player states that way as well. But in this case, the server's trying to spawn a bomb. It says, get my cur current player controller state. We casted it to our actual player state that we've implemented. We check to see if bombs left is over zero. And if so, it spawns. And then we decrement it. That seems to be working just fine. The logic seems like we're there. But it's not being replicated. And we know that because neither client is seeing the red material. That visualization is on the client itself. Well, if you notice on player state, we got these two little white balls. You know, better way to say that. But you can see that bombs left doesn't have it. That little indicator right there tells you that that variable is replicated. It's set to replicate. If you don't see it, it's not replicated. So that's the big thing there. So we can go to bbomb there, find our, oh, no, it was player state. Find our bombs left here. And if we scroll down on the details, we see replication. We can change that to replicated or rep notify. The difference between the two of these is replicated, it will just set a sync the state. Rep notify will call a function when the state has locally changed. So that happens both on the server and the client. So if the server changes the variable, oh, it's changed, I'm going to call this function. Uh, like if we click it, then uh, in Unreal, it added this on rep bombs left function. This function would get called on the server when that happened. And then sometime later, that syncs to each of the individual clients. And when this client's version of that variable has changed, it also calls that function. So that's useful if you want to do some extra stuff like play a sound uh, when, well, that would be on the spawning the bomb. But you could do some other stuff there. I, I don't, maybe add experience something. But that's rep notifies versus replication. Stuff still replicates the same way. It doesn't matter in that case. It's just whether or not you want to have this extra function to do it. You can always remove that, you know, change it back and remove the function manually if you change your mind later, or vice versa, you can add it later. So cool. Now we have this bombs left. All we had to do is change replication to one of these two here, things here. And theoretically, bombs left should now replicate. We change our number of players to two. And so if we drop some bombs here, OK, so we saw it change on client one, but we didn't see it uh, change the color on client two. And then vice versa, if I run out of bombs here, those states, those materials aren't seen to update. But, oh, well. So the individual clients have gotten the new state, but the other client hasn't gotten that. I'm starting to think that I didn't solve this bug. So we're going to real time figure this one out. So the pawn is what's changing the material. So let's work our way back. So uh, in the pawn here, we have a timer to check the bombs every half second. And if we go to check bombs here, so at begin play, can we execute cosmetic events? That just means we're not a dedicated server. We have a graphical user interface. It just means I have a player, essentially. Then we're going to set this timer. So clients are calling this check bombs function. It's so always remember, good to check to see who's calling this function. Is it the server? Is it the client? Is it both? Because you're going to be constantly debugging, figuring out what context are you in. Because sometimes you're going to have it replicated, sometimes you're not. And then you're going to mix things together, and it just gets a big you know, mess. So uh, we're checking the bombs here. We say get controller. 
So controller is the parent class of player controller. AI can also have AI ha also has a controller, but they don't have a player controller. But we can get this pawn's controller here, check to see if it's valid. And if so, get the player state, B player state, bombs left, change the material depending on if bombs left is zero or less. That all looks good. So anyone might see the issue here? Let's add a breakpoint and test that theory out. So we're going to want to see if the other client's pawn. OK, so I believe this is how we can, we can test that theory well. Oh, this happens every half a second. Well, let's uh, get rid of the break point here. Let things finish doing its thing. Hmm? OK, so we're here now. We're on the client. But which client are we on? We're on client 1, looking at pawn 0. So that's ourself. For, for ourself, we do have a valid player controller. So let's go ahead and advance. OK, so the controller here is unknown. And we're on the client here. So we're client one. Uh, you know, I really, really wish that they would just have client one and two because that's what they named the windows. But this is client one for BP pawn one, which is not zero, so that's two. So that's the other pawns on our client. But we see that get controller is invalid. Anyone remember why this is the case? Correct. Controller is only replicated between the server and your self. It's not replicated to other players. So while this compiles and it looks fine, get controller is invalid because I don't have that other player's controller. Well, that's easy enough to fix. This is just a bug. And all we have to do, we're in the pawn. In the pawn, we could just say get player state. And you'll see there's also another variable on the pawn here for player state. And that's the, that's the replicated thing there. So we can thanks, Unreal. So we can skip this whole is valid thing for this controller. That's, that's bad code. But we can get the player state directly, and now Let's see if that works. Hey, look at that. So now we have that bombs left variable is being replicated to all clients. And the function to check to see whether or not we have any bombs left is just using the right reference to the player state instead of using the invalid non-replicated controller variable. And so that's really it. I almost forgot I put that bug in, but good catch. So for those that are to refresh on the reason why that happened is client 2 did not have player controller 1. It wasn't replicated. It's a totally invalid object. It would if you ever tried to pass it as a variable in, a, in an RPC, like in a multicast message, hey, go do something with this player controller, that function will get called, but that, will, that instance for the player controller variable that you sent over will be none. So you have to make sure that you understand where controllers fit in and where they don't fit in. So that's what I have for the demo. It's real easy to kind of just get quick up and ready to get started with multiplayer. Um, things get a lot more complicated. But before we get into that, let's talk about list and servers. And remember, we had play as client, play as list and server. And the real distinction is between dedicated servers and list and servers. List and servers are great for peer to peer player hosted matches. If you wanted to have a quick, I want to host something, I want players to connect to me. Uh, that's where a listen server comes into play. You can make listen servers, package them with the binary built thing from Epic. Uh, usually have like a little host button to get started. 
Uh, it's great because you have no server costs. You are pawning those off to your client, or your customers, uh, but you have no, you don't know what your hardware is. You don't know what your network conditions are. So players are going to have weird things happen because someone from Asia is trying to play with someone in North America, and they're both in rural places, and it's just like not working well. But it's a great uh, way to get started with multiplayer. Uh, it's definitely a viable option for indies. Dedicated servers you're going to find when you want to have more competitive games. Something you want to make sure that you can rely on what the hardware is running on the, ser the, the game and what the network conditions are going to be like. Now the listen server that has the built-in client, you just click, you run the game, you say host, and nothing else happens. It's all in that same executable. You're running a server and the client. In dedicated servers, it's only just the server. It runs in the background, but you do have to build Unreal from source. Now, this is easy. It's just a couple of follow steps. It takes a really long time, depending on your machine. Uh, and, then, and then there's an update. You got to do it all over again if you want the update. Um, and the only reason for this is not really technical. It's just so that the binary size, when everybody else wants to download it from the launcher, it's just an extra like 20 gigabytes less. Um, so it takes a little bit of extra space to have that. Um, so this extra complexity that you have to realize, well, oh, well, now we have this custom engine. Now we have to like, each person, each developer needs to have this. How are we going to distribute it? All these things. So usually. It's for you know, games that ha have a bigger budget, make a studio hosted servers for these competitive more games. So it's still a viable option. Indies have done it all the time. Uh, it's just a little bit, a little bit ba extra barrier of uh, entry there. So is C++ required? Do I need to learn C++? The answer is no. It's a big no. Uh, eventually, maybe. Um, it really depends on how advanced you get. Do you want to use the gameplay ability system? You have to know a little bit of C++ to hook it up, but you don't really need to know C++. You can just copy code. Uh, ChatGPT will give you the answer, too, for that. But uh, eventually, the idea is that C++ is there for as the game gets more complex, whether it's single player or multiplayer. It doesn't really matter for multiplayer any more distinction there. Something's not exposed from C++ to blueprints. Well, now you need to add a little wrapper library to make that happen. Or there's a bug and there's a crash or something like that, and you want to figure out what's going on. Well, you're going to need no C++ to debug how to go through that. But I recommend you just get started. If you're interested in multiplayer games, you can get started at, uh, with blueprints without knowing C++. Uh, I, bit my, I built the majority of Rockland all in blueprints. It worked fine. Performance wasn't a problem. Uh, it just comes down to as your game gets more complex, your team gets bigger, then you need to have uh, other things. But we can talk more about C++ later. So this is easy, right? I mean, we checked one, two boxes and changed two drop-down menus, and we had you know, basic multiplayer functionality, right? We don't need C++. Listen servers are viable for indie studios. And you have to like, think about where your code goes. But you probably should be doing that anyways, because it's more uh, flexible as you go down the road. And then maybe if you decide you want to do single or multiplayer later, you can add it. It's really hard to add multiplayer to a single player game that wasn't thinking about multiplayer from the get-go. Very hard. It's like, just don't do it. But no, stop. Multiplayer is not easy. It's easy to get started. It's a hard journey. Uh, and that's OK. Just be prepared that you're going to be in for a lot of different headaches. And the reason for this is you're thinking, I do this all the time, even knowing multiplayer. I'm like, oh, I can add this mechanic for fishing real easy. I just have to add this thing with a, a, raw, a stick with a socket attach it to the hand, and cast something. I mean, I don't even have to cast something. I just, for demo purposes, just have that in there. And then I can have inventory increase on some random probability. Well, things get a little bit more complicated now. 
Do you want to show the struggle of phishing from the other client's perspective? Do you want to see the client one that's phishing from your client two? You want to see client one struggle to fish, to, to angle that fit, I don't know if that's the verb, to bring the fish in. Things start getting more complicated, then you put in bugs, and then you have to debug them, and debugging is more complicated, so everything takes a little bit extra time. And a lot of this happens because you implement a feature and it works, but you were playing a standalone, or you're playing as a listen server. And you said, oh great, great, everything's working because I have this one viewport, play as one client, play as listen server. Well, there's no replication happening because you have it all, so make sure you test as a client as well. Don't, you don't have any latency on your machine, so now you have to think about that as well. The, uh, Unreal has emulated network conditions. You can emulate uh, latency with different parameters there, and that's very helpful. But at the end of the day, you're gonna have to package a game and test in a multiplayer scenario of people on different networks. So there's also drop packets, and that leads us into reliable RPCs. Well, if you didn't see if we go and look at our player state here, and uh, no, 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 player controller. And we click on bombs left here, and we look at the uh, details panel, you can see underneath replicates, there's a checkbox for reliable. This isn't a TCP message, it's a still UDP, everything's UDP and Unreal, but it does ensure that the message will get delivered. It does not guarantee order, it just guarantees delivery. So that's something to think about because I thought it was the other way around and that bit me for like two weeks. But um, so you can check that and you might be intended to just check it on everything. I want this to be sent. But most of your messages are gonna get delivered. They're still UDP and now you have this extra network bandwidth. And then you start adding like 15 players on a player hosted server in a bad network condition, you don't wanna be sending a you want to limit as many times you're sending network messages because eventually that becomes your bottleneck, believe it or not. So if you're using a shooter game and you're shooting a single bullet, but you're going to shoot like another 30 of them, every single bullet event shouldn't be uh, reliable. But if you're shooting a cannonball out of a cannon and there's a 30 second reload time, yeah, you want that to be reliable. You want to make sure that everyone, the server, they all see that cannonball go out because if they missed it, well, you know, it was probably worth the extra cost. So they're good, don't be afraid of them, but don't go overboard with them. Spawning on a client does not replicate at all. So that really comes into play, making sure you understand what context you're in in a certain function. I got called from this function, from this function, from this function, Am I on the server still, or is this got triggered somehow from a client's event on the interface, the UI interface? Shrug. Use an RPC to tell the server, like we did, we had to check bombs, that tells the server to spawn it, and it then replicates down. Putting all your RPCs in player controller is great. I recommend doing it at first. Gets you up and running real quick and easy, but be mindful that you may want to refactor as your game grows. This is gonna cause tight coupling with the rest of your game, and as your game gets bigger, eventually have long asset de dependency chains, another talk, great talk that I will do eventually, um, where if you load, I don't know, the splash screen, you end up loading the entire you know, game. You don't wanna do that. So making sure you don't have tight coupling is great. There are some ways to, ta uh, to counteract that. Love to talk more about that. Uh, afterwards. Actor components are these things that you can attach to actors if you're not familiar with Unreal. They won't replicate if the actor isn't set to replicate. There's a flag for you to uh, set them to replicate. So if we see this static mesh component and we look at the details Component replication. You can check this flag, but if the actor itself isn't, if, if you check this and you go to the actor's defaults and look at its replicates and it's not checked, 
it won't get replicated. Make sure that the parent's replicated for the children to get replicated. Makes sense, but it's going to bite you a handful of times. And there's so, so much more. Uh, I can talk a long time about the tribulations that I've had making not just a multiplayer game, but a scalable one. And then now building a thing to make it so that other people can make scalable games easy. It's a hard road, but it is a very fun, enjoyable one because you can now do much more interesting things when you add more players. Oh, I think there's so much more. I added this other slide. Anyways, another thing to think about. How are players going to find each other? Great. You added multiplayer. It works in the engine. Great. You packaged the game. You ran the EXE twice. It all works. Now when they're on different networks, how are they going to connect to each other? How do they know which IP address is going to... Uh, to connect to. Well, Steamworks is the first and probably the recommended way, especially doing, uh, you know, listen servers, peer-to-peer uh, -peer stuff. Steamworks works great. There's a plug-in here with a link. There will be access to these slides afterwards. Uh, that's free and easy. I've used it in production scenarios. Recommend that. Or use Epic Online Services. These are basically two different things that run on the cloud. Steamworks is part of Steam. EOS is part of Epic, and they, people will log in with their credentials for their individual accounts, and then you can have it list out the different servers that are being hosted through that. Then they will figure out and do all the handshaking to make sure you know which IP address to go connect to. That's great. Redwood is my scalable Multiplayer framework, that's if great if you want to use like a dedicated server, you want to have your own cloud because you want to have a database and a whole bunch of other things. We can talk more about Redwood. Definitely not a place to start. I would personally, I would start with Steamworks. Steam is a pain, a pain in the butt. Oh my gosh. But it's a great option. Uh, you're probably going to ship to Steam anyway, so why not? Epic Online Services is getting pretty good. There's a built-in implementation in 427, and the stuff in 5, and even 5.1, is starting to get pretty good. Or you could use this third-party uh, Redpoints plugin. It's actually pretty good. They've been doing it for a long time to add the implementation for that. The last one here is thinking that adding dedicated servers is easy. You got listen servers, and you're like, great, I want to now host a public server for all my people to join or whatever. Well. You have to compile the source, and you have to distribute it to your team. That's another thing to have to think about. And then you have to package both the client and the server build. So now you have to build twice. You have two things you have to test. Uh, and if you have multiple platforms, then you, you just doubled. Depends on how you're, if you're going to have only studio-hosted dedicated servers where you can say, oh, I'm only going to be on Linux. Uh, or if you're going to have uh, player-hosted stuff and you also need to have Windows uh, binaries for your servers as well. And then you have to, if you're going to support both listen and dedicated servers, well, there's logic that you have to think about. Because before, we were just like, oh, just check to see if we are the server or we're a client. But if you are a server, you're also a client in a listen server. But you may want to make, well, I want to know if I'm only the dedicated server. So some extra checks there if you need to do that. And then you have to distribute this and host servers, and there's a whole slew of other things there. So I hope that I came across the idea that multiplayer seems now hard, not easy. But it's easy to get started. It's easy to get forward. And while everything is burning down, it's still going to be OK, because there are lots of resources for you to not only get started, but you to continue your development uh, cycle here. The Unreal 5 docs for multiplayer, much better than Unreal 4. I would check those out. Uh, it starts from the basics, then they get a little bit deeper. And if you ever want to get into like replication graph, what's the priority of each of these different messages? When do you want to send them? When do you not want to send them? That's real advanced stuff. I'm not going to touch that for a long time, personally, but there's that. The UE4 network compendium is an old but good PDF uh, that was like 415. Uh, I recommend going through like at least the first 13 slides or so uh, before they get into some examples. But they do have a, like C++ and then Blueprint examples too there. That's pretty good. That's where I started with learning how the, all the stuff gets replicated and things like that. And then I watched Ryan Laley 
I, I really like his courses just because he gives a playlist and they're bite sizable chunks, 10, 15 minutes at a time of different things you might want to do in game development. He has one on multiplayer. It's in UE4, but it, a lot of it replies. So it's a great hands-on experience of getting started with making multiplayer with blueprints. Then there's a popular C++ course. A lot of people use that. Uh, it's available on gamedev.tv and Udemy. I think Udemy had a sale like four days ago. Uh, it was like 75% off. But if you're interested in doing it from a C++ perspective, I've heard really good things about that class. I haven't taken it myself uh, personally. Again, C++ is not necessary. And if you don't know C++, I recommend starting with Blueprints and then add C++ down the road. Uh, if you need it, you can get very far without doing it. I work with an indie studio that is 99% Blueprints, and they've been operating for two years, shipped. So you know, there's that. And then you have Unreal Slackers Discord, and you have Unreal PDX Discord. Uh, these are great uh, resources. I'm on Unreal PDX all the time. You can always reach out, and we could talk shop. So that's all we have for today. You can access these slides by taking a, I believe that QR code is going to be good enough. Uh, we'll also post a link somewhere in the Discord as well. Um, but I would love to have any questions. Thank you. And we've got plenty of time for questions uh, before we get kicked out. Yes? Um, how easy is it to transition a listening, uh, let's say, game to just dev tools? So the question was to uh, how easy it is to transfer between a, less, a listen ser uh, game designed for listen servers to just dedicated servers, is that correct, or to do both? Um, so for the recording, he said maybe you would want to do one or the other. And the short answer is there are rare circumstances where you might want to do both. This one studio I'm working with, they um, started with a listen server, uh, and it, that was it. And that's how players would connect. Uh, but then they wanted to have a world where other players could connect to that they host, but they didn't want to have it running on their personal machine. right? Uh, and so we added dedicated server support for that. It's not that difficult if you were strict about how you understood context properly through the events, server versus client. You didn't put a lot of get player controller as a node in Unreal, and it says player index zero. It's easy to put everywhere. And if you do that in where it says is server branch, and you say get player controller zero, well, player controller zero on the dedicated server doesn't exist. So you have to think about, in those specific cases, uh, how does that logic change? So not a lot of work, but if you already understand the listen server stuff, uh, then you can you know, fairly get it to the point where you can run dedicated server pretty easily. You just have to worry about the other complications of, that comes with dedicated servers. Oh, it's much easier than going from listen server to dedicated server than it is to go from single player to multiplayer in any case, yes. Any other questions? Yes? What are kind of like rules of thumb you use when deciding if something should be reliably replicated or, or not? Cool. So the question was, uh, what are my rules of thumb when I decide to use reliable for a RPC versus not? If it was me, I would have it enabled by default and then disable it when I want to. More times than not, the events that you're sending are one-offs. They're just, this thing happened once. I bought an item at the shop. That's it. Uh, you'll be surprised how many times that happens in the game. Uh, but the problem is, is that you have to now be very conscious about disabling it. Um, so for me, it's usually more times than not, I would like to have it reliable. Uh, and then you know, it really comes down to total volume. 
how many times is this going to get, if, it, if it's on tick, how many times does it get to this branch that is actually going to do this thing? Uh, if it's on tick all the time, no, no way. I mean, the frequency probably should be pretty low. Um, we're talking about, you don't want to be sending uh, this one multiplayer feature. You don't want to be sending that RPC, you know, more than five hertz in a sense, uh, probably even less than that. So it's really a judgment call and it makes sense why it's disabled by default because now you can ship the game and if you have problems, you can enable it uh, or refactor as you see fit. But uh, it, it depends on your game. Are you letting players from across the world join the same server or is it very localized? Do you have matchmaking that makes it so that only players with a ping less than 120 are gonna be able to see that, uh, see that server. And if that's the case, then your network drop might be low. Just how important is it that that message gets to the server? So going to the server is really important unless it's like something like movement. I am holding the thumbstick up and every frame I'm sending, a, I'm doing that. That's not replicated. And then, but care, the, the logic in Unreal makes it so that you can do some really cool stuff if you ever miss a frame. How do you like replay it back and things like that? We can talk about that, but, but anyway. Long story short, more times than not, have it reliable. Uh, this, uh, and then if you think it's a, repeat, a repeated thing that's gonna happen, if someone's holding something down and it's more than one hertz, think about disabling it. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Sure. Uh, yeah. If, um, so say you want to do uh, a full multiplayer game. Is the approach best to just write the analog game up first, or, or do you start off from the very beginning to write the multiplayer game? So the question was, if you wanted to start a simple multiplayer game, should I start with a standalone game and then add multiplayer later, or should I, is it cool for me to start multiplayer from the get-go, is that correct? I, if you have any intention at any point in time to become multiplayer, you could ship your game as a single player experience, but the entire time, if you can help it, if you're at the very beginning of design time, implementation at pre-production, think about multiplayer. You can not have to test it in a multiplayer scenario. You don't have to actually play as client, play as listen server, but think about where logic is existing. Which of those gameplay classes is something going when you're implementing it? Because it's really, really hard after you get, it just depends. If we're talking like a month's worth of work, yeah, you could add multiplayer later and not have to worry about it. If we're talking about, you know, 30 person years of work, no, that's, you're, you just, shot yourself in the foot if you made th that game and then decided you want to make that multiplayer. Probably be easier to rewrite it at that point and then pull logic over. So at the start, if you're thinking about multiplayer ever, think about these kinds of things. Uh, it will save you so much heartache later. Anyone else? Yeah? No, it's Sorry. Oh. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't develop on my laptop because, you know, when I compile an engine three times a day, it's, uh, I'm on my main machine and I use my laptop as like a workhorse. So no, I don't have anything here to kind of show you those issues, but we'd love to talk, you know, when we're at the bar, if you're gonna be there or on, on Discord to talk. Is that Micah? Yeah, I yeah, got the voice. We can talk more about that offline. Yeah. How reliable is physics for Unless you're, you know there is unless you're going for it, it's real pain, and you 
Yeah. Is that pretty much the same situation? Like yeah, so the, the question is how janky is um, physics in a multiplayer scenario for Unreal versus like typically it usually is real janky. It's still pretty janky. Um, if Are you're looking for like Yes. Uh, I'm not the subject matter expert for that. I know uh, Zach, who is not here today, error 454 on the Discord server, he did dive into more deterministic stuff there. There are solutions, it's a pain um, to, to work through that. So it just depends on how, what your fidelity you need. Any other questions? A lot of great questions. What happens to the game on a dedicated server when one of the player connects or disconnects? Is that correct? So when a player disconnects, it takes a couple of seconds for the timeout logic to happen, trigger to real. If, if the player didn't log out, they alt F4 or the network cable got cut or something like that, it takes a couple of seconds for the server to even know that that happened. There, you know, like I said, everything's UDP, so there's no like socket, unless you implement a socket to have you know, real-time stuff, but they do send pings back and forth to make sure that the connection's still live. Um, and if it stops receiving those pings, then eventually what happens is, oh, my player controller has gone away, uh, and I believe the player controller gets destroyed on the server, uh, the player state therefore gets destroyed. And I want to say the possessed pawn might get destroyed. I think it probably by default would. Uh, and then there's probably a thing where you don't want to happen. Like you're riding a vehicle that was spawned in, and you're in Fortnite, you go into this vehicle and then you disconnect, you want that vehicle to still be there. I'm guessing there's a way to disable it from being destroyed. I just know from my experience where I only had one pawn that would just disappear. And that gets replicated, the destruction of that gets replicate that pawn, tells all the clients, hey, if you're interested in this, you're relevant, you're nearby, basically, then this got destroyed and the client will destroy their version of that pawn as well. So that's kind of generally what happens. Oh, and then there's the player state on the game state uh, that would also get destroyed. So if you were doing get player array, and you're looping on that on the client for some reason, eventually one of those player states would say being destroyed and then eventually won't be there anymore. Like pending kills, I think. So would... Yeah, uh, I would not. It's just one thing, yes and no. The big thing there is Things go invalid all the time in multiplayer because people disconnect all the time, purposely or not purposely. And so now, instead of on a single player machine where everything was just there, if it disappeared, the game probably crashed. Uh, but in the multiplayer scenario, you might want to be checking if something is valid much more often than in a single player scenario. So if you're looping on that array, don't assume everything in that array is actually valid. It might be pending kill because they got disconnected recently. Yeah? Uh, how expensive typically would you think spotting an actor or a component to be on a server? Like if you have like, if you're shooting a lot of rockets, for example, would you want to spawn 100 actors on the server and have them replicate down? I'm assuming it would be kind of hard to keep or get destroyed, or spawning local actors and how many members is variable, keeping track of the state? So to rephrase the to reiterate the question, um, how expensive is spawning an actor on the server? Uh, and then the example was spawning a bunch of missiles, uh, like 100 missiles. How expensive is that to spawn on the server and replicate it down? I would say, well, like 100 rockets in a single second might be a lot. Um, 100, 100 rockets in five seconds? Maybe not that big of a deal. 
100 rockets from 10 different players in five seconds, yeah, that's, you're probably gonna start pushing it. And it really just comes down to what other stuff is happening on the client. You can, if you're on a dedicated server, not that big of a deal, you know the hardware. You have a budget, this is your RAM, this is your processor, it's great. But if you're doing a listen server, and also on clients, you have to think about, well, do they have OBS running? Do they have Spotify running and Slack and then 50 tabs of Chrome? And now you have a bunch of network stuff that's happening all at once and it can get kludged up and you might see a delay of that being replicated. Um, so more than anything else, if you're C not CPU bound in that instance, which you wouldn't for like 100 rockets on either case, uh, even like a thousand, you, you were talking, you know, thousands before you're like more CPU bound, unless you're already CPU bound by other reasons. Uh, it's really network bandwidth, and you want to limit that because you're already sending an, a UDP message basically every frame for movement. Uh, and if you're also sending rotation, that's another UDP message that's outgoing. And so if you think about that, you're already sending something every tick. So sending 100 and then it's sending, hey, there was a thing, you know, not that big of a deal, but at the end of the day, it's case by case. Do you have 100 rockets with 10 people and they're all making explosions and things like that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I would say you get, start to get creative about it if you ever have issues. I would say do it, just replicate it, Test it locally, great. Test it across two different networks, great. And then, and then live with it. If you ever have performance issues, then, uh, then you can start talking about how to solve that. Sorry, it wasn't like a real answer to that question, other than it depends. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, if you did, is there any like, other steps to get it replicating besides just setting the <clears throat> So the question is for the example, uh, how did I get like movement replicated? Um, so for the example itself, uh, so all this is doing is enhanced input. You have to add like this uh, mapping thing and then uh, you don't need to worry about that. So here you can see I have a move. So I did not use a movement component because I wanted to make this as dirt simple as possible. Uh, I recommend using a character movement component on, that comes by default on the character class because it has a lot of extra network stuff that you may be interested in and then modify that as you see fit. Uh, I mean, that's... That's a decade of work that has gone into that component. In this specific scenario, I just say when I want to move, which is WASD, uh, call this server move, and you can see it's replicated to the server. And so I just send a 2D vector. Uh, right? Oh. Oh, yeah, 2D vector, WASD. It's two dimensions. Um, so it's forward, backwards. It's one dimension, left, right, so the other dimension. Uh, I send that vector and the way I'm rotated, and I send that every frame. And then I just say, get the pawn and add movement to it. Uh, rotated by, get the vector, rotated by the way that they're facing in the camera, and then it just adds that movement, and then that gets replicated down. So real simple here, I, I wouldn't personally do this unless you're doing something real simple like this. You didn't want to deal with the extra stuff, but character movement component, uh, new. I will show you real quick why it you want to use the, move, the character movement component that comes in the engine is very valuable. Um, there's a talk by people at Overwatch 
that talked about how they use ECS entity component system. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the S, uh, but they, in there, they had an example Sure. about how they deal with dropped packets. And they had a really nice graph of showing about how they deal with movement being dropped. And they talked about this really cool you know, solution to the problem. And then I was like, wow, that's really cool. I need to implement that. I opened up character movement components already in it. So. Yes. While we wait this to do its thing, any other questions? Mm. So the question is, uh, do I find myself uh, compiling with Windows and Linux very often that I use a Linux-like terminal like MinGW or SigWin instead of like Visual Studio? Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask. I'm like a Linux first person forced to use Windows because of the gaming industry. Um, so I prefer using and MinGW terminal anyways, and I hate Visual Studio, and I hate Writer. So I use VS Code. I am like the rebel on rebels. Uh, so I do. You don't have to. Um, when I run a Linux, if I want to actually run a Linux server, I will run that on a dedicated machine. I won't even run that in WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, um, because I have run into issues with that. It does work. I have run a server on WSL, and I could connect my clients to it. Um, but I end up packaging up, and then I have another machine that has Linux on it, my media server, and I just run the server on that. Um, so the answer is I do, but not for those reasons. Um, you can, in Visual Studio, you can right click and say, change the target from Unreal Editor to Unreal Game. That's the game that includes both the server and the client. Then there's Unreal Client. When you compile from source, you get Unreal Client and Unreal Server, extra targets that you can also build uh, that's just the, the individual ones. So it's pretty easy to do it in Visual Studio and uh, Writer, so you don't need to. I end up writing a lot of batch or bash scripts uh, because batch sucks uh, and I don't like PowerShell either. So I'm not the right person to ask, but you could, like, if you like it, you can do it. Um, but it's not necessary. Did I answer your question? It should find it. Oh, thanks. I don't know why Visual Studio didn't want to process it yet. Uh, so here, or not Studio Code. Uh, in the character movement component, nope, nope, and nope. Uh, somewhere in here. Oh well, let's start off with the fact that this is a C++ file that is almost 13,000 lines of code, and all of that is valuable stuff. Um, and so, it's heavy. So if you want to like really strip things apart, I would use this as a base and start cutting away of what you don't want. But 
it's like, because there's flying and swimming in it too, for whatever reason, but um, it's going to handle all of that network stuff. Um, I don't remember the exact function, but it's valuable. I would use it uh, if, if you can afford it. So you could just start with a character for a pawn uh, and, and then go from there. I would even implement a car with a character first. And if I had issues with that, then I would maybe implement my own pawn. Uh, but I was look, when I was doing this example, it was like there was stuff in pawn, there was a lot of stuff missing in pawn, the base class, uh, that made it easier in character. Default pawn is actually a class. Maybe look at it. Inheriting from that instead of pawn, if you want to have start start from nothing, kind of deal. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned earlier that if you're you know the password is server set up, you're kind of at the mercy of whoever you think of as host. So you know. Sorry, let's just to stop you right there. Please back up and say it again. I didn't hear you. Okay, so let me see if I understand the question. So we were talking about how listen servers, you're at the mercy of target, your client, your customer, the player's hardware in network conditions. And let's say we had four people playing a game and one of them was the listen server and for whatever reason, because they're running OBS, because they're streaming to Twitch and they're, they've got Discord open and it's just not a great, environment for the server to be running and it's causing performance in this stuff, can we migrate it to another, someone else in the session, is that correct? Yeah, in that case, or if they decide to leave the match. Or if the server decided to leave the match, can we give it somebody else? I do not know of a way to do that. Um, I haven't been motivated enough to solve that problem yet. Um, the one time where it was an issue with the studio I've been working with, we just kick everyone from the server. Well, they get a disconnect message, and then I just tell you that the server was, you know, they left. Uh, I think the answer is no, because there's a lot of stuff that's on the server that's not on every client, so you now have to, like, send all that stuff over, and they have to instantiate that stuff, and then everyone has to change who they're connecting to, and then, are you using Steam in which sense Steam has its own like networking protocol because you're going through Steam services? How does that handshake happen? I think the answer is just going to be not worth it. Kick everybody and restart. Um, I'm sure if you cared enough and you had enough time and money for it, you probably could solve the problem, but it'd be pretty custom. You'd probably be modifying the engine a bit to do it. So for the recording's purposes, uh, someone else mentioned about designing the game from the forefront to have a very peer-to-peer -peer architecture in which it was easy for anyone to disconnect, kind of leader follower where the leader can be pro or followers can be promoted to leaders and whatnot. And I'm sure you could implement that in Unreal. It's not designed with that principle on the forefront. I'm sure you could make it happen, but it's not ready to go for you. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, what kind of rules do you have for what should be handled in server versus client for like key permissions and that kind of stuff? What kind of rules do I have for what should be ran on the server versus clients? Yes. Uh, and what was the last part? For like key permissions, permit players and things like that. 
sorry, say that part. To prevent players from being able to cheat. Uh, if cheating is a problem, server authoritative is the way to go, obviously. Uh, because even if you can package the game, you can encrypt all your, packet, your packages and things like that, they could still add modules and find a way to make it happen. Uh, so I have to ask myself, well, so my, in my game in Rockland, I have a bunch of to-dos everywhere. Make sure they can't cheat and I haven't solved the problem yet. Um, so first thing, the first rule is identifying where cheat, you know, attack vectors are possible. Um, things like, I purchased an item. Well, maybe they could look at the, uh, in Wireshark, figure out what that network message looks like and spoof something to make it so they don't even have to, you know, I got the item is the way. Implement things that make sense where you're sending it to the server and the server has to check state as well. So if you're purchasing an item on a shop, you're gonna say on the client, do I have enough money? Because I'm not gonna send the message if I don't for like 99.9% .9 of the clients, they're not cheating. So you could prevent a whole network message without having to deal with it. Then also on the server, don't just, oh, I, want, I, I purchased this item and here you go. You also check the, the balance of the player's inventory before they can actually do that. Checking their level, their XP for gates and things like that. Uh, those are the ways you prevent cheaters from happening. And then, if you're doing listen servers, you know, the server can always cheat still. Uh, and that's where dedicated servers come into play. Um, so generally speaking, check both twice. Check on the client for conditions for doing you know, important things, and then check server. So, you know, checking if every single bullet that got fired, well, so don't say that I, I'm firing a bullet from this location in that direction. Say I'm firing a bullet in that direction, but use the location of the player on the server, because otherwise you could spoof your location and they could be you know, firing from the other side of the map. So you just have to think about, but doing a check to make sure, like, is this location where the player is located that they sent to me is actually real and plausible? That would be, well, I guess not that expensive, you know. It's just a quick vector math. You do that all the time. So check twice uh, and limit what things they can send to, your, to the server and let the server's state decide what, how it happens. And then if it happens where there's a lag in this specific scenario, I think I'm here, but the server thinks I'm over here, three feet away. Well, we got that camp recording. Then um, it's okay if the server spawns a bullet from over here once and so long. And then eventually it gets so bad because you have 300 ping, you can't compete because nothing's working anymore and you just don't use that server. Um, that's usually, players will, it just comes to the point those kinds of features hinder players with higher ping because there's latency and there's drop packets and things like that. Uh, so the state's not one to one but that's okay because those players shouldn't be playing on that server in that case. Can I answer your question? Yeah, I have a question. Would you, do you have anything, like any rules used for identifying those cases? Any rules for identifying those cases? Uh, not really, but basically anytime you say run on server, when a client is sending something to the server, I think, okay, what's being sent here? And what is the state, the overall transaction history? Like, what state is changing on the server from this message that I'm getting? How much of this do I trust and how much do I not? So it's basically any time I set up a new event that says run on server, I am now taking input from the client and I have to decide how much I want to trust it. And you have to judge on, that's the identification, and then you have the judgment of what you're willing to sacrifice uh, for ease. Any other questions?
Cool. Well, thanks everybody.